Welcome to the SoCal Classic Car Podcast, the exclusive place for coverage of car culture in Southern California and the personalities that drive it. I'm your co-host, Jay Marash. The show is associated with SoCal Classic Car Storage, which provides South OC car lovers the opportunity to secure their vehicles in an environment made just for them. Our two facilities feature advanced security systems, 24-hour video surveillance, and a dedicated member's lounge. In addition to storage, our expert sales staff offers consignment services for those looking to sell their cars. For more information, visit us in Laguna Hills or our website, SoCalCarStorage.com. Thanks a lot, Jay. And yes... He's right, this is the SoCal Classic Car Podcast. Welcome everybody, and this is our fourth episode. And I am your host, Dean Morash. Jay says I'm his co-host, so I better stick with that. I'm proud to have as our guest today, someone who hails from South Africa. Vaughn Gilmore is an off-road customization expert who's had a wrench in his hand and been racing from a young age. His passion for Jeeps began when he moved to the United States and bought a CJ7 at 16. Wow. However, the United States was not quite wild enough for his love of overlanding, so he moved to Australia at 22. Since then, Gilmer has conquered the outback, completing many three-week and six-week off-road journeys. All that experience led him to create his own business, making and importing off-road accessories to prepare vehicles for the rough conditions of the deserts and freeways of SoCal and beyond. Now he's back in the States building incredibly beautiful and enduring off-road machines at his Laguna Hill shop, Rebel Off-Road. The brand has virtually exploded around the world since 2010, amassing more than a half million followers on Facebook and 150,000 on Instagram. I don't know what that means, Bob, but it sounds great. Welcome to the show. Well, why? Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. Bon, why don't you start by telling us a little more about your business, Rebel Off-Road with some insight into the inspiration behind it. Was it your years in the bush down under and around off-road vehicles that helped you develop a passion so strong you wanted to create a business out of it? Um, no, that really wasn't. It's just um, I've always, you know, growing up in Africa, and, and uh, I'm Irish, but growing up in Africa and living in Australia, uh, moved here, then moved to Australia. But long story short is when you're, when you're uh, in remote places, um, it's necessary for you to uh, figure out how to work on the machinery that's around you, right. um, and in doing so, you know, you know, I used to race motocross and BMX and such, and in doing so, you develop a bit of a passion for uh, the things you're doing. Uh, for me, it came to uh, to off-road vehicles, and as soon as I came here to the states, the very first vehicle I got was a Jeep. Um, so it's kind of taken off along the, the Jeep side of things. You know, people have asked me about, you know, did I get much into when I was in Australia, for instance, in Africa, they don't have Jeeps, so uh, right. they mostly got uh, you know Toyotas and Nissans, etc., um, and Mitsubishi's. And yes, I, I I was into those. I didn't own any of them myself, but I was into modifying them. So anything that was going to work to to be able to go out and travel um, was the important piece to me, and it would kind of became a, a second nature to me. You know, if you're crossing, put it this way, like for if you were looking at Australia, yeah, picture. Going from you know, it's the same size as the United States approximately. It's got 23 million people. When I was there, it had 17 million people. So not a lot of people live there. Wow. And it's the same size as the U.S. We got you know 25 million people living in the greater L.A. area. Right. And if you were to take a vehicle and let's say, hey, and, and your family and want to travel, let's say from Los Angeles to perhaps Chicago, picture doing that without actually having any cities in between, or basically having a few tiny little towns with maybe 20 or 30 or or 200 people in one of them perhaps. And that's the distance that you have to cross. So you got to know how to fix your own crap, or, you other, or else know. you're not getting there. Exactly, you know. And uh, same thing, kind of in, in uh, growing up in South Africa. While it's not nearly the same size, Africa's a big continent, um, but South Africa's not that big. But you have all this space in between uh, towns, and right. when things go wrong, you know, when shit hits the fan, shit hits the fan, right. and you don't want to be stuck out overnight, especially in places like Africa with the uh, with some of the animals that are there. Um, so, <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to become meals on wheels, as they say. Right, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid of a wallaby, but I think I would be afraid of a lion, Jay. I think that scares me. Do you but, know what a wallaby is? No, but I've heard of them. Hey, uh, I, we're also curious about this notion of a passion, because Jay and I have had this conversation of why people take the risk of being an entrepreneur. And I, you know, for me, in in my business, it had a lot to do with I'm really passionate about cars. It's been in my life since I was a little boy. And my dad was super passionate about cars. So he passed that on to me. Do you think that 
that has something to do with why you started this business, or does it have a lot to do with why? No, it's got a lot to do with why I started the business. You know, when you have a passion for something, people sometimes say, "Hey, you know, if you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your right. life." Well, that's a bunch of horseshit. If you love what you do, <laughs> right, you, you, know, you work your ass off about the things that you love. Right. And in in my case, you know, I love the the off road aspect of it. Growing up in, in in Africa and also you know living in Australia and such, everything is is you're outside all the time. So being outside and being in the dirt, which is also why I race motocross and BMX, um, is that all ties into your your passion for the outdoors. Right. And the best way to see the outdoors. Um, you know, to see a lot of it is through some type of a mode of transportation. Hiking's great, done a lot of that too, um, but it's you can only see so much of it right. in, you know, in, a, in a day. In our busy lifestyles these days, you know, we want to be able to go places. We want to also be able to take the family with us. Um, so the passion that is just it's a fire that's inside of me. Wow. Well, that answers the passion question, Jason. I think um, you you and I have had that conversation many a time, right? What about working hard? No, just more about <laughs> driving. If uh, anything, you work you work hard. Well, you work more more hours doing the things that you're passionate about. But so it does. But it, I, I, I I tend to agree with Bond. But does it feel like work? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But not always. It still does always. But not feel always. Like not work. always. So <laughs> even though it feels like it feels like work, I mean, but you don't mind putting in the extra work. So it's, it's still work, but you're yeah. you're. And you want to be, you know, with anything you do in your life, no matter whether you're working for somebody else or you're working for yourself, you have to have some passion there right. um, in order to be successful. And one of the other things you've always got to do is, you know, you have to give more than you receive. Right. You know, as a business owner, you know, we've got our clientele and our customers, and we give a lot to our customers. And, you know, we take them on off-road trips. We show them how to utilize their vehicles, how to use them, uh, how their new accessories that they've installed are going to work. Um and we don't just do that here in the in the showroom or in the shop. We right. actually take them out and use them with the customers. We go all over the country, you know, Moab and Florida, et cetera, and Kentucky, Tennessee, you name it, a lot of the states, right. and we go to them. So, uh, but you've, you've got to give. Right. Uh, and, you know, what we're in is a service industry. You guys right. are in a service industry. Right. And yep. quite frankly, every industry is a service industry. So, you know, if you're an employee, you know, you've, if you're getting paid 10, give 11. Always give more. Right. If you're the, you know, if you're a business owner, you've got to give more back to your employees. Yeah, you've got to give them back to the, uh, to the your clientele. It's a great point. It's one of the things that we try to strive for is to exceed expectations in our business. Like we want our customers to be blown away with the extra mile that we go, arranging for servicing of their vehicle, arranging for a paint shop to come picking up and fix a dent or a chip. Um, now, how do they get washes. that dent or chip? Pardon? <laughs> so now, how do they get that dentro chip? Well, it's not from us. I can be. <laughs> I can assure you of that. No, I've seen your facilities. They're very, very, very Thank nice. You. And uh, yes, I mean, I actually utilize your facilities, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy with them. Thank yeah. you. So, a little confusion here, Bond. Uh, are you Irish, Australian, South African, all of the above, or does it depend on the bar that you're hanging out at? Well, that has a lot to do with it too. Um, you know, being Irish, yeah, we are. You know, we're known for for being drinkers, and uh, but uh, but not angry drinkers, just uh, well, fun, fun drinkers. Fun drinkers. Um, but really, realistically, what it boils down to is, um, I wouldn't say I'm anyone in particular. I'm all of the above and more. And uh, you know, here's here's how it works. I mean, we're all on this one planet together. Right. So I mean, these little lines that are drawn up by whoever drives up these lines. Yeah. You know, is somewhat of a, a, a bit of a bunch of nonsense that we have to watch. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to quote good old Crocodile Dundee here. You guys know who he is, yeah? Yeah, we've seen him on TV. I yeah, that's good old Mick Dundee, and he said, you know, it's like two fleas fighting over who owns the dog they live on. Yeah. You know, the Earth's going to be here. It was here before we came. It's going to be here after we're, after we're gone. So, you know, for us to say this is mine and this is, you know, the rest of it is, eh, we've got to watch what we do there. So uh, I'm a, I'm from planet Earth. I don't really have any desire to go visit You don't have an identity, per se. So what about your accent? I'm assuming that's <clears throat> from South Africa. Is that correct? No, nah, it's probably... Or is that more Australian? It's probably more Australian. Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up in South Africa and lived in England and Ireland and lived a, a lot of different places. Um, but my accent is probably, you know, it's a bit of a mix and it's probably a little bit more Aussie. Aussie. Okay, cool. So I am intrigued about a lot of parts of your business, but the one that really fascinates me is one that I haven't had a chance to participate in, and that is uh, the events that you go to, these places like Glamis and Calico and Ocotillo Wells. It appears that like these cities pop up overnight at the right time of year, 
and all these Jeeps and off-road vehicles invade the place, including uh, suppliers like yourself, and you guys are there, like you said, to help your clients learn how to use the gear. Uh, but, what, but what drives all that? It seems from a distance to be some insanity. It's uh, uh, Can you give some insight into that for us? Well, I can try. I mean, the way it works is like uh, when these cities pop up, you know, in the, in the deserts, especially out here in, in Southern California area. But, uh, you know, it also happens all across the country. Um, but basically, here's how it works. You know, when, when you're getting ready for some of these events, uh, if it is a big event that's going on, people flock out to the deserts to go enjoy themselves. I mean, it's public land, which is great. And here you know, on the West Coast, we've got a lot of public land available to us. So uh, when people are going out there in droves, it's uh, good fun to go out there and everybody's hanging out, got a nice bonfire going. Uh, it's usually uh, winter months because, you know, the desert's a little too hot during the summer. Right. And, you know, it's just this attraction of uh, it around either a particular vehicle or a particular race um, or just in a particular event and people are out there. We also do the opposite. Sometimes we go where nobody is. Right. So some of these cities that you see pop up, they're fa I mean, you know, you look at uh, you know King of the Hammers, for instance. Right. I mean, it's a zoo out there. It's a great zoo, though. That was my next question. That's that's like taking it to the next level or two, right? That that's insanity compared to uh, some of these smaller desert uh, events, right? Uh, like King of the Hammer, it's a fantastic event. I love it. Uh, I've raced it a couple of times. Uh, oh yeah. Yep, yep. But uh, in addition to the, the racing portion of it, is uh, just going out there for the uh, for the camaraderie that happens you know people flock out to the desert and as I said you know have these huge big uh, gatherings um, it's you know we have a huge gathering ourselves and uh, we, we throw a big party for our uh, for our customers out there um, and people like to get outside you know they bring the families um, the other thing is to keep in mind is that a lot of these are family events right so you bring families kids wives and uh, they're having a good time. It's a way for them to escape these vehicles. Uh, the design behind them is really the, the notion behind them is so that you can escape. You can right. escape the, the mundaneness of, you know, the nine to five job or the weekend coming Working around. for you or I, for example. As a, yeah. you, is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Something along those lines. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jay, have you been invited to any of these uh, desert uh, events? I, I've never no, had No, I'm, I'm not cool enough for that. you got to be... Oh. It's not a question about being cool. What we about just got to get you the right vehicle. <laughs> Am I, I do cool? have a, I do have a Ford Bronco. I just haven't um, modded it out yet or brought it over to Rebel Off Road. <clears> yeah, you got to get the Rebel. What year is this Bronco? Yours? 1990. 1990. Yeah. As we were sitting here, I was getting a text from a friend of mine as a big demolition company in Texas. He's just found one out here. It's a 1996 Bronco, and he says, "Hey, could I uh, possibly go and pick it up? Where the hell's Upland?" I'm like, "Well, Upland's about an hour away." So. <laughs> Literally, that was uh, five minutes ago. That's cool. I, I, have you guys mm -hmm. done Broncos over there? We've done some Broncos. Um, the majority of what we specialize in is the is the newer Jeep vehicle. People are flocking towards those for a whole bunch of different reasons. You know how they drive, how they behave. You got space in them now. Sure. Um, that kind of stuff. A lot better technology than a. Yeah, there's a lot of technology built in. A lot of technology built into them, I and mean, yeah, you can get them with lockers and. You know, low transfer cases, et cetera, straight from uh, straight from right. the dealers. Yeah. Well, what is King of the Hammers like for those who haven't been there? Um, so seems it, like a really picture, fun time. Picture Burning Man probably times ten. <laughs> uh, for those of you who haven't been to Burning Man, uh, Google it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Watch what you might see there. <laughs> Burning Man. Uh, does, so there's more lawlessness out no, there. No, 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 not not. Is not that a modern lawless. day commune, Burning Man? Is I, that really I, what that is? I, I couldn't tell you. I've actually never gone. I got a lot. I haven't of, either. Got a lot of customers that have gone, but uh, mm -hmm. I haven't gone. But you know, King of the Hammers because the race is on and the race is over. Um, there's multiple races uh, that the King of the Hammers has. You know, there's King of the Motors for the motorcycles. There's what's called the Everyman Challenge. You know, the Ultra Four Class, of course. Um, that's the big boys and the fully modified anything you want uh, vehicles. And uh, they race them on different days. And as well as that, there's qualifying. Uh, last year, they brought out uh, some trophy trucks to run the trophy trucks in a in a, in a slightly different uh, class, if you will. Um, so there's, and each day there's different activities. In the nighttime, there's a, there's a real tough, the, the trails out there, I'll warn you, come with some strange names, right? One of the toughest obstacles out there that they hold an event at is uh, called the Backdoor Challenge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's actually the obstacle is called Backdoor, so it's to try and climb up Backdoor. And, and basically, uh, you get people coming from uh, all different, that are competing in the backdoor challenge might come out from, you know, they get the, the rock bouncers from the East Coast coming out to, to see what that's going to be like. Um, they get invited out, and then you've got the Ultra 4 guys. Um, you know, these rock bouncers are on 54-inch Are these people tires. from uh, around the country, <clears throat> or are they actually coming from around the world? 
What's the what's the reach? So, uh, the King of the Hammers itself yeah. is is really from around the world. You get people from all different countries coming down to race yeah. it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Sounds like something Hunter S. Thompson would write about. What is what exactly is that uh, backdoor challenge? So, can you describe mm. that? So, the backdoor challenge is uh, there's an obstacle called backdoor. Now, the trails out there have got all sorts of different names. Yeah, you know, one of them's called Chocolate Thunder. You know, uh, don't ask me how these guys came up with the names on these <laughs> on these obstacles. <laughs> yeah, right. another, another one that's way on the back side of the mountain is called Spooners. You know, and the way the Spooners <laughs> got its name was it gets cold out there, and it's a tough, tough, tough trail. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, two people, you know, one one of the vehicles broke down out there, and uh, the two guys had to. Uh, in, the, in order not they to, had to survive the, the night, they got to do what you got to do. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. Have hey, you I'll, raced it yourself? The a King of the Hammers? Yes, I've raced King of the Hammers twice. Uh, my a friend of mine's got the uh, got the race car, uh, so I'm navigating for him uh, in the race. And basically, it's like being in a 12-hour plane crash. Wow. It is spectacular. How's your bladder and your kidneys at the end of all that? Well, funny you should ask, because uh, you actually wear a catheter. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Wait, is that a you true know, story? Yeah, that's a true story, right? But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not the hurtful catheter. It's the it's the easygoing one. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but oh. yeah, so I mean, you, you know, you gotta you, you gotta, gotta be able to go to the bathroom. Do. So uh, okay. yeah, and you can't stop racing to to go pee in the bush. So what does it take to win that thing? Um, so I'll give you, uh, I've never won it. So I'll tell you what I think might take to win it. Um, a lot of luck, um, a lot of perseverance. Picture this, there's about 140 vehicles that start, and maybe around anywhere from 12 to 20 that might finish. Wow. So there's a lot of luck inside of there. As well as that, you've got to have a very well-prepped rig. Um, the fascinating thing is the race is, you know, they, it's three different laps uh, over, three diff over uh, rocky terrain, uh, rock crawlings built into it, and some de open desert as well. So the hard piece is, is to try and figure out how to build a vehicle that can do well in high-speed desert, as well as do well on the rocks, and I mean rock crawling at high speed. Off. So when you go to the race, it's spectacular to watch because when you go and look at the lineup or contingency, you see all these different vehicles. There's not one of them that looks the same as the other. Every other form of motorsport, they, all the vehicles all look the same. Yep. You know, you look at you NASCAR, NASCAR, Formula One. Yep. You you choose it; it makes no difference. They all look the same. You go out to King of the Hammers. Every vehicle is totally different because everyone's got a different idea of what might work that year to get over those obstacles wow. and try and, and try and do well. Fascinating. I want to take a little different direction now. One of the things that I'm really intrigued about your business is the design work of some of the specialized equipment. It's good that we talked about these races like King of the Hammer and going out, Ocotillo Wells and stuff, because it seems to me that there's extreme requirements, whether it's articulation, how much uh, lit, you know range you got to have on the front end, or durability, you mentioned that, like to survive a race. So what you know what is it that you know goes into designing this gear and then producing it and making it work i mean it g give me an idea of that what that's like for you guys as a as a business so for us when what we're looking at uh, when when putting a vehicle together is um yeah obviously you got to work with the constraints of the consumer as well as the constraints of the uh of their budgets and what we look and tell a customer is listen you know let's look at how you think you're going to be using the vehicle two years from now, all right? Not what you're gonna use it for right now, but two years from now, because this is a sport where you grow into it. You get, you start getting used to it, you're rock crawling, and now you want to, you, you conquered something, and now you yeah. want to conquer some bigger obstacles. So what you look at is, okay, two years from now, how, do, how does this vehicle supposed to be functioning? Um, and what you try and do is minimize, it's very hard to eliminate, but minimize the amount swapping of double out. spending. Yeah, swapping out parts yeah. for better parts. Yes, so you want to minimize that. now. Uh, unless you know you know exactly what you want right from the get-go and you come down to the shop and you see a lot of our heavily built rigs and I want that exact build yeah. or something like that that's you know okay so then it's a one-time build um, but for the most part you know you, people are growing into this and it's families growing into it so it's not it's not a macho thing there's the other thing with with, with jeeping and, and going off-road it's it's not a macho thing it's about everybody's out there to help each other get through something and have a lot of fun doing it so when it comes to designing something the the main thing has to be um, those are a whole bunch of different points. One of them is going to be, and it's a strong point, is to make sure that the vehicle is not only going to be safe, but really, really so that you can get the family back home. Right. You know, in one piece. In one piece. Not airlifted. No. And the other piece is like when you're out and you break down on the trail, when you're 18 years old 
uh, and you break down on the trail and hey you know you're going to spend the night there and, and it, you know, yeah you, you it, can it, rough it yeah. yeah you can rough it you know but uh, as you get a little older you know and you have a family and, the, and the, you know your wife and kids you don't want to be broken down on the trail and have to rough it all night long with you know with you, with young kids or your yeah. wife that's upset with you now etc so you want to put on the components that are going to work uh, that are going to be strong enough to. Can't you put a four-star tent in the in the back? Well, we do that too. You know, <laughs> I put them on tent. the roof. Put them on. Yeah, the rooftop tents are fantastic. So, but is it growing then? Is the hobby here in Southern <clears throat> California growing? Um, so, I think going not just here in Southern California, but I think uh, the world over. The fact that these vehicles are now very capable, and the odds of getting back, uh, getting you guys, you know, getting people back home. Um, when I say back home, back out of their adventure, back um, to civilization. Civilization, yeah, is uh, is pretty high. So uh, people are taking you know more risks and doing bigger things with them and going on bigger trips with them. Yeah. So I did see evidence of people actually coming back alive in your uh, driveway of your business one day. Remember that uh, white Jeep? Uh, I guess white. I don't know what to call it. But uh, the guy flipped it. Remember, he was going over that uh, oh, we've had, feature. Yeah, we have quite it, a few. But he had his wife and his, uh, and his daughter, daughter yep. in, in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And it came back, and, you know, honestly, there were a few bent pieces, but the roll cage and everything did exactly what it's designed to do. And I thought to myself, there is no way I'd subject my family to that. But that's kind of what this is all about. It's part of the adventure. But if, if you're if you're feeling, you know, if, if you and the rest of the people that are supporting the industry are getting to a point where you've got confidence, like modern day cars and, and race cars surviving these horrific things, then it, then safety is, is much more achievable, right? Uh, it is, when and of course, happens. the way these vehicles are built, and especially when you put roll cages inside them, um, they make them very safe. And, you know, the, the key thing is, of course, where you say, where, where your seat belt. Um, that's that's the number one thing is you got to be wearing your seatbelt because right. even when you know rock rolling you might roll slow it's still a roll uh, you might flip it on its side it's still a flip you got to keep your you know, hands in hands you know hands and legs and extremities inside the vehicle at all times as they as I say yeah, on the ride right. Disneyland it's kind of like a Disneyland Herman there ser sentados por favor that was good Jim yeah yeah sorry no hablo español <laughs> So, <laughs> so one, one so place you, you haven't been, right? <laughs> so, but one one aspect of your business that um, we haven't touched on really is that you guys do design and have fabricated some of your own designs, right? Yeah, correct. And We've what, got. Um, I mean, you're, you've got test mules. I mean, you've got some fantastic, way over the top jeeps and other vehicles that you've really just used as test mules to continue to you know, stay on the cutting or bleeding edge of this, um, you know, yeah. this whole industry, we, right? we try not to bleed too much, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. but now nah, when it comes to the, you know, we're very well known for our coilover kits. Um, you know, it gives you heaps of wheel travel, et cetera. Um, and yeah, you got to, we have to design these cars so that they drive nicely on the street and work incredibly well off road. And that's where the magic comes in, having a vehicle that can do both. You know, you're not building just an off-road buggy, and you're not building something as strictly for the street. Uh, our customers utilize their vehicles, so you're not building, you know, what we call mall crawlers, which are just driving around looking, looking cool. Looking good. Yeah, I mean, looking good. We want to look good, but with these things, got to function. And Is most there, of our customers do, do take people them get penalized for not using their vehicles if they look too clean, and you can see that it's never been out in the sand or climbing rocks? Is, is there a penalty for that? Yeah, there is. Uh, you know, and it's it's usually the social media penalty. Uh, <laughs> you get shaved on social media, do you? Well, we don't, but uh, you know, people do. Uh, you know, we get to see it all the time, and you know, people. You know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why you want to build a cool vehicle. Um, you know, sometimes it's just the internal piece that you want to have a, a, a lovely piece of equipment, uh, and it turns into a piece of artwork, by the yeah. way. Well, they are. Mm -hmm. I'm and blown away at how beautiful that one that you just recently <coughs> built, you have parked in front of your shop, is that's a Rubicon? Uh, um, or no, that's so, I, well, I've got, got a few of them out there. <laughs> right, right. Which one are you talking about, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. But, you know, for, for us, it's got to be, you know, it's got to function as well. Okay. Um, and not only has it got to function, as I said, most of our customers do take these things off-road. And I absolutely love when our customers will say to us, you know, hey, I know you built this thing for me and it's built like a tank, and we like to build them like a tank because that gets the family homes. We put on, you know, home. we put on big axles, strong suspension, strong components, stuff that's going to work, uh, you know, lockers, bead locks, etc. Um, and we want to be able to get the family home. But what I get the biggest kick out of internally for me is when I have a customer that has, hasn't done some crazy obstacle and they look at that and they go, Bond, can you get me over that? And I'm like, well, let me see if I can get over it first. And I mean, I might struggle sometimes to get over some of these things or it came real close to something going terribly south. 
you know, and I'll say, hey guys, here's here, here's what here's what happened with me. You know, what do you guys want to do? And when they look me in the eye and they say, Bond, I don't give a shit. It's a piece of metal. I want to make it up wow. that. I've got my family here. I want us to be able to go that. Get me over that. And uh, you know, they get over it. And sometimes there's some scrapes and scratches. Uh, but that's part of playing. That's part of the course for playing off road. Yeah. Well, it's funny. We're in a business where a scrape, a scratch, a ding, or a neck can be the end of the world because uh, our our customers are so obsessive compulsive about the condition of their vehicle. So when I see, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 dollar rigs getting scraped up or bumping into a rock or a uh, it's just, you know, it's kind of devastating from my view, but you're saying it's all part of the fun, right? It is all part of the fun. You know, it's like a it's like a scar, you know, a scar is kind of like a tattoo but with a better story. You know, yeah. when you get these uh, scrapes and scratches and you've taken your vehicle off road, you know, there's some fantastic stories behind there and usually some great photographs too. Right. You know, and it's it's bra- it's like a bra- badge of courage. Yeah, you know, I was going to say bragging rights, but that's actually wrong. Badge of courage is better because they aren't bragging about it. They're, they want to share. They want to say, man, look what the hell I just did. You know, this is incredible. I got this vehicle that, you know, that Rebel built and it works. And look at this thing. Look what it, look what it did. Yeah. You know, yeah, I got some, I got some scrapes and scratches, but, you know, I mean, you look at these obstacles and think, how on earth can a vehicle drive on these and then drive you home? Right. Well, it seems like in your industry and your business requires a lot of ingenuity. Have you, um, as some of the products that you sell are things that you've invented yourself? Uh, and if so, how many, you know, how many inventions have you made? Well, when we talk about inventions, and like for us, you know, we do we do a coilover kit, um, and we do other components too. But when it comes to suspension working. You know, a coilover it works so well that it gives you so much more droop, so much more wheel travel. Um, and when you when we're developing these things, we want to make sure, as I said, that they're going to vehicles are going to work fantastically well off road, but also be capable of being driven on the street very safely. Um, so because you're going to have a family inside them, ordinarily these are going to be family driven vehicles as well. So you know, when you look at the different components and how you're building them, uh, you have to take into effect into effect all of these different factors. Yeah. You're not building strictly an off road buggy. Right. Yeah. You know, so you're building something that you need the family to be safe inside, but everything else has still got to work. They still want to push the cruise control button and have the thing drive down the road, and it's got to drive straight, um, etc. So, you know, the components that when we're designing components, we have to take into effect into effect a lot of these different factors. It's right. not just a question of, you know, build, you know, go out and, and you know lay some stick and, and, and weld some stuff together. So let's talk a little bit about the Jeep Gladiator. That seems to be all the rage. Did I say it right? It's a it's basically a four-door Jeep truck, right? That's so, exactly what it is. And I think you, you were out at SEMA uh, showcasing some products that you co- jointly developed or uh, were involved in at SEMA, right? So let's and talk a little bit about too, yeah. those products yep. as well as this this phenomena that called the Gladiator, for lack of a better definition. So yeah, I mean we've got suspension, we have uh, long arm suspension, we you know control arms, we've got short arms, they're adjustable. We've got the coilover kits, and in addition to that, we have uh, bumpers that are, we're just about ready to release our bumper line right now. It'll be front and rear bumpers with different stingers, different skid plates on them. So how did you get all these products already for a uh, vehicle that's only been out for what a year or less? Did did you get some advanced? Um, we got a l- touchy we got, feely. We got time. a little bit of touchy feely time ahead did of time, you? and uh, I think that has to you know FCA, which is Fiat Chrysler of America, came down to <laughs> to pay us a visit. And, did they really? Uh, they did. Yep. Oh, cool. And uh, it was a little bit a little bit ahead of time. And uh, when I asked them, I said, you know, why did you choose us? I said, you know, where else were they going? Right. And I said, nowhere else. What an honor. Yeah, it was. And uh, so I said, well, why did you choose us? And they said, well, we've seen what you guys do. We've seen the caliber of the work that you guys do. Um, we've also seen the presence that you guys have of, at events, wow. and uh, and also obviously on the social media side, um, and you have this huge following. And uh, you know when you look at uh, uh, Yelp reviews, etc., we're, we're through the roof, and uh, they they were jazzed about it. So they brought us down this vehicle to, you know, they let us put it up on the rack and said you can't make, take any photographs, uh, you know, but you guys can put it on the rack and kind of tear it apart, just put it all back together, and. Uh, you can't wow. take any photos if it doesn't have a Chrysler part in there. We were trying on, you know, 37-inch tires and all sorts of stuff ahead of time. Um, so it was good. Um, what an honor. It really was. And so when, you know, when getting ready for SEMA, we're, that's getting some of these products. With the Gladiator, it's a it's a Jeep pickup truck. And uh, what's nice about it is it's got some space, and you've got this solid axle in the front. 
Um, you've got coilovers, uh, sorry, coil, coil springs and shocks in the front as well as in the rear, so it gives you heaps of articulation. You know, a lot of the other cars are independent, a lot of their uh, trucks, SUVs are, are IFS or independent front suspensions, so you get limited travel out of them. You know, to fit a tire onto, you know, some of the other vehicles like a Toyota, if you're trying to squeeze a big tire on there, you know, to fit a 33-inch tall tire onto a Toyota, you got to do some work. It's, you know, got to get a, at least a few inches of lift on it. To fit a 35 on a Gladiator, you just bolt it on. Wow. You know, to put a, fit a 37 on there is a two-inch lift, and it's an easy lift. You know, to fit 40s, you go bigger. Um, but So, so it's is it safe to say that, you know, these companies like Jeep, like Chrysler or FCA, are learning from companies like yours and your customers to develop their products to be better capable of modifying for off-road. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is it they put that front axle, solid front axle on there for a reason. Right? Yeah, the, you know, there, there was talk about uh, possibly when this vehicle was going to be released, you know, it was going to have a, an independent front. Um, and I think uh, the, you know, the, the true believers when it comes to a solid front axle, it's kind of hard to beat. Um, you know, when you look at a vehicle that you can drive on the street as well as, uh, as off-road, you know, an off-road vehicle that's got long travel like a, like a trophy truck or something, that's different. You know, you're not driving that thing on the street. Right. Uh, but on, if you compare it like the, the current vehicles that are out there, you know, the, the Fords, the Chevys, uh, right. the Toyotas, etc., Jeep's got the solid axle. And that's such an such a, an important piece when it comes to modifying the vehicle. So I think what happened with good old, uh, with, with Chrysler, uh, you know, FCA, um, the Jeep is the most highly modified vehicle on the planet, right? And you know the Jeep Wrangler especially, and the, the Gladiator is a Wrangler front with a with a truck bed on the back, um, so it's a little longer, uh, 136 inch wheelbase, uh, but the longer the shorter it is, it's a Jeep. So uh, they have come out with a whole bunch of different off road accessories themselves, of course. lift kits. Um, they've got uh, you know you, you name it. They've come out with half doors tubular doors, all of these types of cool things, roof racks, etc., that you can, bumpers, win uh, well not the winches, but the winch plates, um, that you can now, you can buy factory ones Probably. from the dealer. Yeah. yeah. Now, the aftermarket is, of course, um, a little bit ahead of the game when it comes to more hardcore components, right. yeah. um, you know, because they're not trying to mass produce, and they're producing for a, a, a bit of a niche market. Yeah. And, you, and your customers are really a niche market, like ours, right? Yep. I mean, is that how you look at your market? It's pretty yeah, niche. It, it is very niche. Um, and doing the right thing is always, you know, always going to be yeah. uh, paramount because you know you, you are in such a niche, niche market. Right. Hey, I want to uh, talk a little bit about your brand. Um, the reason why I bring this up, it you know, we, I put a lot of thought into building our brand before we launched the business at SoCal Classic Car Storage, and and I know what goes into the effort that it takes to promote it, protect it, uh, kind of revise it as you grow. You know, so so got a lot of. I have a lot of um, just, just you know, you know, a passion for that part of the business because I'm an ex-marketing guy. So I look at Rebel Off-Road and I see a really strong brand. You somehow have made it cool for customers to put your brand on their vehicles. So to me, that's really part of your secret sauce from the outside looking in because I'm as ignorant as they come when it comes to off-roading. But that's brilliant. Your brand is so cool that people want it on their vehicle when they're done modifying it with your stuff. So tell me about, was there some genius there or is that? Well, uh, I wouldn't say there's any genius there, but going back to one of the questions you asked in the beginning when it comes to being you know, enthusiastic about what you do, right? Um, that bleeds over. So it bleeds over not, not only from me, but all my staff. All of my staff are enthusiasts, they're off-road enthusiasts. Right. Um, so that when we get somebody coming in and we, and we build a vehicle, I mean, it, yeah, I, mean, I might have you know seen the you see my facility. I might have you know twenty to thirty two vehicles there in a day, right. but every single one of those is unique, and every single one of the owners of those vehicles are unique. And you know we get excited no matter how big the build is or how small the build is because this is somebody that's going to be enjoying what we do. Right. And when you're enthusiastic about something, uh, that enthusiastic about it, that has a, a massive draw. So I wouldn't say that it's you know some marketing genius because it really isn't. Uh, from the outside, it might appear that way. From the reality and the inside of it is, it's just us being us, us being enthusiasts, uh, loving what we do, and helping the customer understand that they can love this too. And helping each customer understand it's not a question of you know, seeing one that's built to the hilt and going, oh, you know, I could never get that. Right. It's not a question about never get that. It's like start using the vehicle off-road, and you will start to love going off-road. And when you start to love going off-road, we know they're going to keep coming back to start doing more things. So each is build it, is, is just so enthusiastic. 
sorry, is it safe to say that some of your customers feel like they've joined the family uh, of this rebel off-road community? I think it's I mean, more than safe to say that? that some of them, I think the majority of them feel that way. You know, we've even got so. some of them have gone out there and, you know, get rebel off-road tattoos. And, you know, I'm wow. thinking, whoa. You know? Jay, do you have one of those yet? I'm, uh, he's lucky. Uh, no? When did I go out drinking last? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's not on the back. You know what I mean? But yeah. <laughs> Rebel Off-Road Tram Stamp. Uh, well, let's not go there. Let's not <laughs> go there. Yeah. And if you have one of those, I don't want to see it. Yeah. Not today. Come on, anyway. I want to be on Maybe if we go to one of the Irish bars that he frequents, we could maybe we could talk him into seeing some of this. I don't know if that's Irish. But well, it might be a South African it, bar. But. Uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't really um, matter how it's evolved, but it is a very strong brand, whether it's a conscious effort on your part or like you said, more out of the, the passion for sharing uh, and caring about your customers uh, and their experience. The majority of it is uh, strictly out of the passion. Um, we have to guide it sometimes, right. but uh, it's, it's 99% out of the passion and the enthusiastic staff that we have and the enthusiasm that we put forth with every single customer's build. Uh, or even if they're buying parts from us. I mean, here, you know, people just say to us, hey, what sets you guys apart? And it's pretty basic, I think, um, from our from our standpoint is, you know, let's say we get an online order. It's not just a question of processing the order. Right. And we've got 40,000 products online, but that's not a question of processing the order off the, off the product goes. You know, we'll pick up the phone and, and ask the customer, hey, so tell us about your vehicle. They're going to start uh, having a conversation with us about it. And we might say, hey, you bought that part, but that part, there's a better part than that. You know, it might cost more, it might cost less. It has nothing to do with the cost. Mm -hmm. um, it has everything to do with the component that's going to work based on all the other components that the customer has. So one of the things that sets us apart is we're going to contact the customer and say, hey, we want it to be right. Because quite frankly, selling them something or if they bought something and we ship it to them and it's not going to work for them, because shipping coming back, it's a headache, boxing, blah, blah, right. blah, back to the manufacturer. It's way better from our standpoint to actually, you know, this is the 1% pieces. You pick up the phone, you have a, have a chat with the, with the customer. Right. That saves all the headaches. But most importantly, what it's going to do for the customer is it makes the customer feel like you actually care. And the best part is we actually do. We wow. want to get in, get to know these customers. I mean, when I get customers say to us, hey, you know, how much more money do I have to spend before I can get a Rebel Off-Road decal on my car? You know, and when they, I mean, I, it's, it's kind of a funny thing for somebody to say to me, um, but it's, it's, it's so true. And, and, you know, here's the way I, I work. When I've got customers that are out there, if my guys are busy, I'm out speaking to the customers. And the customers will ask me, you know, I'll walk them around and show them different things. And they'll say, how much is this? How much is that? I actually don't know the prices. And I tell them, I have no idea what, how much it costs. I said, I know the products that you need for what you've just described right. you want to do. So we'll build it that way. We'll go inside and figure out what the, what the costs are and see if we have to break it down or what we've got to do. But most importantly, it's got nothing to do with cost when I'm talking to you because right. I have no idea how much almost any of this stuff costs. Well, the good news is I was able to get a sticker just by asking, Jay. So I think either I've got a lot of pull or I didn't think to ask well, about how much it costs. Well, you did get a new cost. Jeep. I do have a new Jeep. So is that a Jeep? Ouch. You know what? <laughs> I showed them my Jeep proudly, my Cherokee, and uh, I asked them if they thought there was any hope, and uh, they said, oh, we're sorry, we, we've got a customer, uh, but uh, if you come back a little later on. Today. Well, we gave you a sticker because that'll give you an extra five horsepower. <laughs> so, uh, hey, one of the things um, well, I'm, I'm curious about, Jason and I were talking about this a little bit before we did the podcast, is... How well would your business do in this South Africa or Australia or some of these remote countries where you know, you kind of developed this passion and grew up brake fixing and trying them all? Is it too spread out? Is there a, you know is there an area where it might work? Have you put any thought into this? I'm just oh lots about. of thought. In fact, when I lived in Australia, I, I used to import uh, Jeep accessories into Australia and sell them. Mm -hmm. um, and my first uh, my first company was uh, that I found was in Australia. You know. Um, it's called Overland Equipment, and because that's what we do over there, a lot of overlanding. I mean, this is going back, I'm dating myself here a little bit, yeah. but this is like, you know, the, the late 90s. <laughs> so uh, I've been in this, you know, I've been in this arena for a long time right. and love what I do. Um, but in, in looking at it, so how well can things work overseas? There are limitations with overseas. Out here in America, you know, uh, we have the ability to take a vehicle, modify it, and drive it on the street. Uh, in other countries, you know, France is very tough. Now, we do business in lots of different countries, too. So we sell products to different off-road shops. 
uh, and have some distributors in different different countries. But the way it boils down to is, you know, if you're looking at, you know, let's say Australia, if you're going to have a vehicle that's got more than two inches of lift, you know, the max you can put on the vehicle without having to get a uh, an engineer's report done on the vehicle is wow. two inches of lift. So Jason was asking this exact <coughs> question when we were talking the other day. Um, are all these changes, modifications that are being made on these Jeeps and these other platforms street legal? And in the United States, I, I said I think the answer is yes, as long as they can be smogged and you know you know the basics, right? Yeah, the, the rules out here are pretty uh, pretty uh, open. You know, I mean, technically you're not supposed to have a tire sticking in California. You're not supposed to have a tire sticking out past your fender well unless you have a mud flap on it. You know, and you go to, and we don't have much mud out here. Now you go down to Florida, no mud flaps required, nothing required. You can have no fenders, no mud flaps, and that's perfectly legal. Yeah. And there's plenty of mud down there. And there's mud <laughs> everywhere down Snakes, there. Snakes too, those are scary. <laughs> no, alligators. Alligators. Yeah. Well, is the hobby of uh, overlanding a lot bigger um, in you know South Africa, Australia? So over there, it's not. A, they don't call it overlanding. You're just going traveling. In order okay. to travel, you've got to go overland, right? Right. Um, yeah, because wait, how many how many you know times have you crossed the Australian continent, uh, you know, off-roading? Well, I've I've gone to the center quite a few different times, and then I've gone up through. Uh, I used to live up in the Blue Mountains out, you know, outside of Sydney, um, so going to the center is pretty. Uh, it's a pretty long ways, and that's about a, you know there and back, and uh, it's about almost three weeks worth of a trip. Um, you also head up. You know, I've gone on other trips where you head up to you know. Uh, up to Cooktown, which is in the in the north. Uh, unfortunately, I was trying to go the whole way up to the uh, to the to the top, but uh, the rains were coming, and when the rains come over there, you can't travel in the north. Yeah. So I mean, the floods are just humongous. Well, I bet you have some interesting stories about all your uh, continental travelings in Australia. Do you have like a like a crazy story that you could share with us, or? You know something amazing that happened. Tell them we're not PG your, thirteen trips, because I mean you were probably <laughs> doing that. You know at a time, um, you know what? If you know, dec you know a decade or uh, two more than ago. that. Yeah. yeah. So the technology wasn't <laughs> what it was. You weren't so born yet, you, and he was doing it. I bet it, you Jay. found yourself in some you know hairy situations. I was just wondering if you could share with our audience, uh, you know, maybe a story about that. Ah, well, actually, I'll share with you a story that happened here in the U.S. You know, talking about um, cool. Uh, you know, you can still get stuck even, you know, you can still find the middle of nowhere even out here. Um, I was uh, down near San Diego, this was back in uh, the mid-90s, and uh, had my Jeep and uh, had my girlfriend at the time, and I, you know, I was just dating her, I think, I, I must have been early 90s, actually. And uh, I said uh, to her parents, I said, hey, you know, we're going to go camping, just going for an overnight run. And uh, didn't come back for six days. <laughs> uh, and although it sounds like a good time, what happened is they called the cops. Well, they uh, went. This is of course before cell phones. I think it was like '91. This right. happened, and uh, you know, got uh, we're off roading, uh, jeeping, and uh, you know, broke the front axle, knuckle broke off, and we're out in the desert. And this is you know, I think this happened on a Monday night, and they were supposed to be back on the Tuesday. And uh, long story short, is we were stuck down there. I. Uh, uh, literally, it was six days. Uh, we had passed a, a ranch house that was about, uh, well, we had to walk back to it. So it was about an hour's walk back. And each morning, what we would do is, because I was working on the Jeep that was now stuck in a huge hole with the, with the axle broken off, and I'm trying to fix it. And, uh, you know, not too many tools and ratchet straps and everything else and uh, high lift jacks. And long story short is we had to hike every day over to this, uh, this, this farmhouse that was all boarded up. They did have some chickens. And I didn't want to eat the chickens because, you know, they're not mine, but we did take the eggs. And every day I was living on myself and the girlfriend at the time were living on just nothing but eggs. Chicken eggs. Chicken eggs, right? And were I'll say eating, wild chicken eggs. Were you eating eggs. them raw or was it hot well, enough to cook on the rock? No, so I, we, you know, we'd been camping, so, but uh, by day four, uh, we're, I'm exhausted. I'm in digging for days trying to get this thing out of the predicament that we were in. And uh, by day four, I was so exhausted. Day five and day six, I just took the entire uh, chicken egg and shell and all stuck it in my mouth and was was crunching down on it and that's you know i was a <laughs> we finally made it out of there and that's only like a you know call it about two hours from where we are yeah it's amazing well it sounds like I uh, that was pretty tough mentally there i think we're just fortunate to have you in our studio today bond i mean that could have been the end of you uh, it could have been I'm, you know, it I'm could have been the end of some chickens too I'm it's getting close that to that i'm surprised parents <laughs> didn't kill you i mean you're here you survived somehow so yeah, these things happen anywhere you go. You know, it's uh, it's just that you know that's that's one that obviously sticks out. And you know, it's not an overseas story, but it's like the same thing can happen real close to home. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so um, 
why don't you tell folks that are listening, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up, but tell folks where we can, everybody can best contact Rebel Off-Road. Well, you know, we're, we are down here in Southern California, uh, 23501 Commerce Center Drive, and that's in Laguna Hills, California. Um, obviously, you can go to our website as well, which is www.rebeloffroad.com. Um, on there, you can see, as I said, about 40,000 different products, you know, the stuff that we manufacture, the bed uh, racks, etc., the bumpers, uh, you know, suspension components and, and other stuff on there. But uh, that will be the best place to go see us. Or actually, if you're, if you're in Southern California, come on down and pay us a visit because, quite frankly, you haven't seen a showroom like ours. You haven't seen a facility like ours. And it doesn't matter where you go in the country. When we get people coming out here for SEMA okay. uh, and other shops and they come down to see us, and they're in shock to see what our facility is like. It's a, you know, it, it's very different. Uh, the caliber of the vehicles that are there are through the roof. Awesome. And everything for you to see. Well, plus if people can't come see you, face your Facebook page is awesome. You, you've got a lot of great content on there, uh, uh, videos and pictures. Yeah, here's the thing: a lot we of, actually and use a lot the of vehicles. Your customers, right? You know, we we get hit up all the time from different companies saying, "Oh, you know, we don't have enough content. Don't have enough content." I'm like, I'm oozing with content. I got more. <laughs> I mean, we have so much content because we use the vehicles all the time. Right. You know, it's up just up in Big Bear for it got nailed in that snowstorm, which is fantastic. The weekend before that, uh, we went out to uh, the Alabama Hills, and then we went to Sequoia. So I mean, we're utilizing these vehicles all the time, and having a great time with them. So our content is like it's busting out of our ears. That's great. Well, it doesn't sound like work, Jay. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to disagree. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, hey, um, thank you so much, um, Bond. Uh, again, that was Bon Gilmer from I'm sorry, Bon Gilmer from uh, Rebel Off Road here in Laguna Hills. They're actually our neighbors, so it's pretty cool to have them on. Um, anything else you want to add? Anything we may have missed before we let you go? No, I just want to say uh, thank you to you guys for having me, and of course, thanks for everybody for listening. Um, you know, but do come on down and check us out. They can also check out your facility because you guys are right next door to me, and I utilize your facility. It's awesome. Yeah, Bon's one of our best customers. Uh, that's for sure. He. Yeah, I, I noticed check this, out our backyard. Where's I, I know. Does that mean I pay my bill? <laughs> no, it, it just means you take up a lot of space. <laughs> so we like customers that take up a lot of space. Well, that's all for us here at the SoCal Classic Car Podcast, the S3CP, as some of the young people like to call it. Um, if you want to listen to more episodes of the podcast, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. All you have to do is just look up SoCal Classic Car Podcast, or you can go visit our website at SoCalCarStorage.com forward slash media to look at the current episode and also previous episodes. Anyway, this is the SoCal Classic Car Podcast. Thank you so much for stopping by, and happy driving.